Come on. Is, that all the is entrusted with the salvation of the world. Wow. Entrusted with the salvation of the world. It's good to know your church. Lucy's not here today. She's taking care of her son who's sick. And you got Alicia who came in. She was a little late, but you know what? She got in at like 3 a.m. on her flight because she's a flight attendant. The teens are all beaten up from yesterday. And many of us have things going on in our lives that are tough. And yet there, there's so many awesome things happening in the church. I don't know if you know in the back, you see Omar back there. Omar is volunteering to be our new photographer. Serve the church and the talk. Come on. Uh, oh, great come, on. Uh, come on. Come on, Come on, bro. You know, there's some, there is some incredible things happening on Friday night. Oh, you know, Janelle Russian is like leading the charge for our whole congregation. She is going to the super oh, That's an incredible thing. Come on, and, and, and I think, but most importantly, the most important thing that's happening in the church is today, Ivan's going to get back to And you know, uh, in the 1960s, before most of you were born, there was a bumper sticker that they, came, that they came out with, and the bumper sticker went like this, Jesus, yes, church, no. And the whole premise was that the problem with church is the people. And yet, that bumper sticker was created by someone who did not know how to forgive. Yeah. Wow. Come on, Ryan. That bumper sticker was created by someone who had very little mercy in their heart. Very little compassion for what happens in other people's lives. You know, when we get out of ourselves for even 20 minutes to find out what's going on in people's lives, man, sometimes it just makes you feel pretty good, you know? Man. And yet, when we have less grace in our heart, fellowship becomes dead. Right. Church becomes strength. Yeah. It often can seem more challenging to come to church than to not come to church. Come on, Ryan. When we get people focused. Yeah. yeah. And yet the Bible calls us to be strong in the grace. Yeah. Now, strong in the grace is kind of twofold. With a group this size, at least one of you committed a bad sin this week. Yeah. Right. And yet, the Bible says to you, be strong in the grace. Forgive yourself because I forgive you. Yeah. Come on, bro. And, and yet, some of you have been sinned against this week. Mm. And the Bible says, be strong in the grace. Give to that person what I gave to you. Yeah. You know, we need fellowship. Yep. Um, you know, today, today at uh, at five minutes to ten, there was like nine people in here. Come on, bro. And I, I just I have to address it. Yeah. I'd be remiss if I didn't address that. Preach it. As the leader of the church. Yeah. And you know, at first I got mad. I was like, "What's going on?" <laughs> and then I I took a walk. And uh, I went outside and and uh, I had a little prayer walk. Come on, prayer. And I got a little more grateful. But then I realized something that like husbands need to realize when things aren't going the greatest in their home. Yeah. I'm the leader. Yeah. So for how dead it was this morning, I apologize to all of you. Because I'm the leader. I should be ministering in a way and teaching our house church leaders and Bible talk leaders and disciples in such a way that you come in here fired up about Jesus. Come on, bro. I take full ownership for it. And I take full ownership for it, so not even one time ever do we come in like that again. Right? Yeah. <laughs> But it just shows, today was a good contrast. It shows how much we need fellowship. Yeah. Right? The service isn't the lesson. See, the lesson isn't really for all the disciples. Yeah. It's for those who are not disciples. Mostly. And, and yet, what it's for, it's our gathering together. It's fellowship. Yeah. 
So those who come late consistently miss out on fellowship. And if you look around and you see who comes in later consistently, you also see those who don't sing as much. Mm -hmm. You also see those who don't give as much. Wow. Because you need fellowship. You see how the whole service changed right after the fellowship break? Right? Yeah. See, we're supposed to come to church and have that pre-fellowship before service. So the whole service and our worship is acceptable. Yeah. It's honoring of God. Just like it's been just since the fellowship break. Right? Amen? Yeah. If you're visiting, this is not, that's not our normal church. We're fired up. <laughs> Come to our games on Friday nights and you see everybody really fired up. Woo! You know, I want to put something before you today. Turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 12. Come on. Revelation chapter 12. <laughs> Usually, preachers go to Revelation to preach fire and brimstone. <laughs> In, Re in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, I want to put a concept in our mind. Salvation is awesome. Yeah, come on. For those of us who have gotten the truth, responded to the truth, been baptized like Ivan's going to do today, we are saved and going to heaven. And yet, Friday night's cheers was way more. Friday night you cheered way harder. Come on. We lost your voice because you cheered so hard for a game. We need to cheer like that because we're saved. someone of wrongdoing later. The accuser is Satan. When we accuse, who are we following? You know What should come from sin being conducted in front of us is first compassion. Compassion that there isn't the strength to be obedient to them. Man, what happened to you? What happened in your life that you don't have the strength to obey God? Let me help you. Let me give you some grace and some mercy. And a lot of God's work. Come on. Yeah. It says, for the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them before our God day and night. Woo. That's your enemy. Yeah. Your enemy is the one that accuses your brothers and sisters of wrongdoing day and night. Has been hurled down. They overcame him. By the blood of the Lamb. <clears throat> and by the word of their testimony. You will not overcome Satan until you're giving your testimony out, sharing your faith with the people of this world. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. See, you overcome it by the blood of Jesus and by sharing what Jesus did for you. That's what the summer of love is all about. It's all about focusing on sharing what God did in your life. Didn't Janet do a fantastic yeah. job? Yeah. I mean, her father punched her in the face at 11 years old. It was terrible. But what happened to him? What horrific thing happened to him that he would punch his own daughter in the face? It had to be bad. We need to find him. We need to find him and not deal with him. Actually, we need to find him and help him. Yeah, come on. Oh, sure. yeah. It says, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and their testimony, and they did not love their lives so much as to shrink back from death. When it got tough, they did not shrink back. They pulled close. Therefore, rejoice, you heavens, and I tell you to dwell in them. 
Be with your brothers and sisters. Have great fellowship. Right. Why? Salvation is awesome. Yeah. Salvation is awesome. The word about salvation here is solteric. It means deliverance. You've been delivered. Amen. Where were you going before you found God? What were you doing with your life before you found God? What were you doing to other people before God saved you? Before He delivered you from that destruction? Our salvation also means preservation. See, God, when He saves you, He puts something inside of you that can never die. You may break your body. You may, you may get down, but that spirit that lives in you never perishes. It never spoils. It never fades. Wow. It's kept forever awesome living inside of you. Come on. Come on, Ryan. This word also, it's one I think we really need. This is the aspect of the word I think we really need. Safety. See, if you are a true believer of Jesus, this morning, and you are saved, not only are you going to go and live in heaven with your Father forever, but while you're on this earth, you are safe. Come on. Come on, Come on, bro. on bro. You don't get it. Woo! <laughs> See, who can send you to hell? I mean, look around the room. Can anyone in here actually send you to hell? No one. So what can they do to you? Oh, oh, talk about you? So for some of you, that's like death. It's just like, oh my gosh, somebody said something about me! Oh my gosh! Oh, 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 oh. You start, oh. Where's that spirit now? Right. And yet, the people that are most reactive talk about other people. I do. Let's just get real. We all talk about somebody sometimes. Let's just get real. Stop getting all mad. Come on, bro. Come on. Come on. Come on. You haven't said something bad about somebody in the last month. And yet we are all high and mighty. Something's talking about me. Yeah, go deal with that, James. With your group. Are you teaching those people? Instead of getting compassion. Okay. Taking the mercy that we have welled up inside of us. See, the Bible calls us administrators of God's grace. You, know, you can't administrate something that's not there. And you can actually push all the mercy, all the compassion, all the grace out of your heart. Where you've got no mercy to share with anybody. And then it's a terrible thing to be around disciples. Because then they're fired up and you're down. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're down and salvation's awesome. What's wrong with that? See, when your relationship with God is on straight and you understand what you've been given and what's in store for you, life is awesome. Right, it is. See, when God is your protector, there's nothing anybody that can do that can hurt you, and you know that. So you decide that that doesn't hurt. That thing said doesn't hurt. That that thing that's unfair, whatever. On, you're, gonna, you're not getting away with anything. You think you think anybody on this earth gets away with anything bad they do? Wow. God's got it all under control. You forgot God's under. He's got it all under control. Yeah. Wow. Right. See, to see to be upset is to say you don't have it all under control. What's up with you? Yeah. What are you doing up there? It's me, right? Come on. <laughs> Come on. And yet when you, when you have it on straight, you understand God will deal with it. Like, I don't even need to deal with you right now. God's got it all under control. I'm going to give you some mercy, I'm gonna, and I'm going to stay out of your way. I'm going to stay back a couple feet. I don't, want, I don't want to be there when God does that, but you got my grace, man. I'm here. You, need, you, you want to go have lunch? <laughs> I take you out breakfast. We read the Bible together or something. Right. But... But we get so mad. Come here with this sour look on our face, you know? Yeah. Like you're not saved. Come on. Come on, bro. You stay like that, you won't stay safe. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Come on. Remember, salvation is awesome. Yeah. And salvation isn't just about going to heaven. 
It's about having the best life that can be lived on this earth. It's called Life of the Fool, John 10. I can share for you a life that you can live. And there's more that he's preparing for you. We'll talk about the last point. Let's turn to Jude 3. Jude 3. about one page down here toward the end. There's no chapter, just one chapter. Verse 3. Jude 3 says, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once what? Entrusted to all the sinners. See, Jude wrote some really challenging things in this book. And he's like, I'm very eager to write to you about salvation. Why do you think he was so fired up? Because salvation is what? It's awesome. He says, but I, I, instead of writing about how awesome salvation is, I decided I need to write to you and tell you, you need to contend for the faith. You've got to contend. Our first point today... <coughs> Is that salvation changes everything. Yeah. Come on. Salvation changes everything. We're looking at four key words in this lesson today. The first one we covered, salvation. The second one is the word entrust. See, you are entrusted with something that we're going to talk about here today. The third is content. What it means to contend for the faith. And fourthly, the word faith. See, we can all use a little more faith. Now. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're looking at all these scriptures contain the Greek words for these things. But remember, salvation changes everything. You know, there's a man who died and went up to heaven for judgment. Peter met him at the gate. Right at the gate of heaven. And he said, before you meet with God, I thought I, I should tell you. We've, we've looked over your life already. And uh, we really didn't see anything particularly good or, or bad in your life. And so we're not really sure what to do with you, we say. But can you tell us anything that you've done that, that, that'll help us make our decision about whether you're going to end up in heaven or in hell? Well, the new arrival thought for a moment. He said, yeah, there was this one thing. I was driving along the road and I came up uh, upon a woman. And she was being harassed by a group of bikers. So I pulled over, I got out my tire iron, and I went up to the leader of the bikers, and I pulled his nose ring right out of his nose. And I told him and his gang that they better stop messing with this woman, or they'd have to deal with me. Peter goes, wow, I'm really impressed. He goes, uh, when did this happen? He goes, about two minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the world teaches about being a good Christian. If you ask somebody, like, what does it, what does it take to go to heaven? Your average person is going to say, I just got to be a good Christian. Really? So what you do gets you to heaven? Because I thought it was our faith. Come on. I thought it was our faith that put us in contact with the blood of Jesus when we got baptized. See, when you are immersed... And you are buried under that water of baptism, right? Your faith puts you in contact with the blood of Jesus. Not all the good things you did. Being a good person. Were you a good person? After the sin study, you realize, I'm not a good person. I am not a good person. Come on, bro. Man, we, we, we went over the sin list stuff with Ivan last night. And we got to the end. And he was like, oh, gosh. How do you feel right now? Ooh, I feel awesome. This is the first time I ever talked about all this stuff. It's yeah. like the weight of the yeah. world. Yeah. Come on. Why is the weight of the world off? Because we're carrying the weight of the world. We're carrying our sin. Because yeah. it hasn't been forgiven. Right. Not only has it not been forgiven, we're not even telling anybody about it. Right. Man, I hope you don't live like that as a Christian. Right. Just yeah. walking around with all this sin you committed, not talking to anybody. Carrying the weight of that sin again like you're lost. Yeah. 
Yeah. Because salvation doesn't seem so awesome when you do that. Right. Usually that happens because we start looking at everybody else's sin and go, yep, you got to repent. Yep, you got to repent too. Wow, all a bunch of sinners, man. I feel good about myself right now. Until you go to sleep. Until you go to sleep and you remember all that, the weight of all the sin that you haven't talked to anybody about. Right. Come on. See, but when you got baptized, God took that all away. That's why we do communion every week. See, the cross made it possible to take the weight of the world off the shoulders. I told Ivan last night, I was like, you know, here's the thing. You're not even saved yet if you feel awesome. Come on. Like, tomorrow is actually going to be forgiven. Come on. Like, whoa! Come on. <laughs> Your faith put you in contact with the blood of Jesus while you were under that water. You came out. We got all kinds of pictures and videos and everything of it. And then you were clean soul. Just like the curtain of the temple, right? That held in the most right. holy of holies, the Spirit of God. Yeah. Ripped open. Yep. Yeah. Rushed out into this world that's been waiting all this time since then to rush into Come your soul. Come on. Come on. Turn to Romans chapter 6. Come on. Right. Romans chapter 6. Come on, Romans. Let's look a little more at this word entrusted. Because I hear that some of you have trust issues. You know where I heard that? From you. Each of you told me. <laughs> Romans 6, verse 17. You're like, who's talking about me? No, you talk about me. <laughs> Romans 6, verse 17. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. Wow. Some places in this world teach that, oh, because you agree that God exists, you're saved. All texts just believe and now you're saved. Baptism, the baptism of the Holy Spirit's on you. And then all of a sudden you have a new life, but then you're still supposed to get baptized to, to die so you can live a new life. It's just a mess. It's a mess. Come on. I mean, even at our worst singing, I'm so grateful for how fired up our disciples are from God. Yeah. Come on. I mean, even at our worst day, you've all been out in different churches and stuff. But you got the ones that they have the paid singers, right, yeah. to put on a show. And it's just that, a show. Right? But here, you're the show. You're the show. You're the, you're, this, we come every Sunday, and we perform. Every song you sing, you're performing. I'm watching. No, I'm performing. We're all performing for God. He's the audience. That's why we come to And God gave you this teaching, the first principles of the elementary teachings of Christ, and he trusts you with it. What are you supposed to do with it? Come in here fired up, first of all. Come, on, bro. Come, Come in on. here early and have fellowship. Yeah. Yeah. Be close to your brothers and sisters. Come on. Give to them and then they hurt you. But you're ready to forgive. You're full of mercy. Great. Right. So it's right. no problem. Come on. And then we just move right along like little kids. You slap each other and punch each other in the park. Come and on. Go right back playing. Come on, Josh. <laughs> See, God trusted that you would respond like that. See, salvation and the sacred teaching, the real true teaching about what it means to follow God and be saved, you were trusted. But you forgot it changes everything. See, you spend so much time getting mad at people that you forget. Give them the teaching and get them to obey it and it's all over with. It changes everything. Come on, come on. See, salvation was intended to literally change everything inside of you. It was intended to change everything inside of you. Even the most awesome part of your soul, God wants to make it so much more awesome than you can imagine. And he wants to take the worst parts of the most evil thoughts and the most evil things that you feel and think. 
and change them into awesome things that change the world. But there's a problem. There's a problem. We feel trapped. We feel taken advantage of. We feel abused. We feel hurt. We feel like somebody's using us like a slave. And here's the problem. No matter what you do in this life, you're somebody's slave. No matter what you do in this life, you're a slave. You're either going to be a slave to your way of thinking and your way of responding and whatever your past produced in you, or you're going to be a slave of Jesus and righteousness. It's your thing. Somebody's your dad. I pray you pick up Jesus this morning. Because Jesus isn't sad. Je being the slave of Jesus means fired up. Yeah. Being the slave of Jesus means gratitude and mercy and also relationships and forgiveness. Yeah. Not because there's not problems, but because you're ready for the problems. Yeah. To respond like Jesus responded when you sinned against him. Come on, that's it. Come on. See, men, before, when a beautiful woman walked by you, you were a slave, all right? Couldn't even control it. Is it awesome to be a man of God? That you can exercise self-control? And what you can do is you can go, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, oh, here's an invite. Oh, call my sister. Don't take my name. that you don't have to be slave to the way you live for so long? But that means you're a slave to Jesus. He's a good master. He's a good master. You know, he's black. I don't care what color he is. He's an awesome master. I saw a video the other day and this black man, his hand had this big old burn. It was one of my brothers in Chicago. Some of you saw it. Yeah. And it, it's this big old bubble. And he went to the doctor, and the doctor cut it all out, and he pulled the skin off. You know what was under it? White. <laughs> <laughs> Does it really matter what color Jesus was? No. no. Does it really matter what color you are? No. Come on. Come on, bro. Preach that. Preach that. I have a unique perspective on race. Come on. I say all lives matter. Yes. Come on. You don't know the problem. No, I do know the problem. I know it really well. My black cousin, Kenny Harding, got killed in San Francisco. Because he jumped the fence, $2 dollars pay. And as he was running away, they shot him in the back. All the, all the bullets came from the back and in his neck, and he bled to death right there on TV. He's one of the few that actually died on TV. So I know all about that. That's my flesh and blood cousin. But you know what? One of my white uncles, who they call trailer trash, was shot for the same kind of stuff. Wow. Tell, me, tell me that only black lives matter, that that's going to fix the problem. Come on. The problem is the judges have too much leniency on the way they, they actually try the cases when yeah. anyone is shot. Right. Yeah. So that's the problem. Yeah. Don't tell me black lives matter. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. White lives matter. Yellow lives matter. Yes. I appreciate the focused effort. Come on. But we fight for every person. Yeah. We're not entrusted with just the black lives salvation. We're entrusted with the all lives salvation. Some of you wonder why they didn't send an all-black person or a Mexican person to Southland. So you could get the right teaching of Christ. Oh, right. oh. oh. And we got black here from Thailand. Come on. about a moment about your conversion. I, it was so moving that as Janet talked about her conversion, she was so choked up in tears of over gratitude for the women that God put in her life. 
She was choked up in gratitude for Anthony Johnson, who shared his faith with her. She's full of gratitude. I mean, man, think about what God did for you through, you know, Christ, yes. Church, no. Really? Really? Are the people really the problem in church? Maybe one person in your Bible talks the problem, right? And if you think that, you're right. It's that one person, you. I mean, think about it. How much have you actually changed? Man. I've seen, I mean, I've only been here two years, and some of you have changed radically. But here's one of the keys to happiness as a disciple, right? See, we study the Bible and, and we stop cursing and, and we stop punching and hitting and, and we stop drugging and drinking and whatever it all it is, your stuff, you know? I mean, Mike has always been in anger. And yet, think about it. You were most happy when you knew very little and you understood how much God did, how much you changed. So what's the key to happiness as a disciple? Going, how much does God know? How much do I know? I don't know nothing. And how much has God changed me? That's it. Come on, Rob. That's all you need to be happy. Come on. Is your salvation and your knowledge of what God did for you. Because if you have that, you'll get it. When you really have salvation, and you really understand what that means, it literally changes everything. Then you have to contend for your faith. Go to James chapter 2. Contending is not just fighting. The word contend it's, it's hard to pronounce. Epagonezomi. Epagonezomi. It means to earnestly go after. Earnestly go after. See, if you learn to earnestly go after your relationships with people, you're going to have great relationships. If you just kind of go after it tentatively, not wanting to be hurt, I have all these things that you cannot do or I'm hurt. If you hurt me, I'm gone. <laughs> Every talk is... Look, don't do that. Is that right? What are you saying? What are you trying to say? <laughs> My dad said, don't do that. That part. That part. Man, life is rough for you. you know? But... But if you really forgive the mm. way the Bible says to forgive, right? Mm. Come on. See, because I've been there. Yeah. I had daddy issues, yeah. right? Yeah. I wanted to kill my dad just like Dan. I hate him. But then when God helped me to realize that my hatred was just as bad as every single thing he ever did, yeah. that put me in exactly the same place. Yeah. I realized I was doing that, some of that even after I got How much worse is my sin then? That I have the truth and I'm choosing anger toward it. Come on, bro. Right? I'm supposed to be contending for his faith and I'm angry. Change me forever. I finally realized that the Bible does not say, honor your father and mother unless they beat you. <laughs> Honor your father and mother unless they put cigarettes out on you. Right, come on. It just says honor your father and mother. Yeah. Why? Because you're alive, you have a chance to go to heaven. Come on, bro. James chapter 2. Come on, bro. James chapter 2. See, James was like that one brother in fellowship. The one that always says what you what needs to be said, but just kind of has an edge on it. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. James chapter 2, verse 14. Faith. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith? I don't need it that loud. You turn down a little bit. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? 
Can such faith save him? See, the Bible leaves that open for you to answer. What do you think? If a person just comes to church and does nothing else, you think that can save them? No. Or suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well. Keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs. What good is it? Come on, bro. See, we get this one all twisted, though. Yeah. See, if you're hungry, give me a call. I'll, I'll come bring you some food. That's true. But try and be a user and abuser and sleep in my house. It ain't going to happen. Nope. Right? It's not going to happen. The Bible says that what we need is food and clothes. If you're naked, I'll give you something to wear. Please. I'll, I'll definitely give you something to wear. <laughs> I'll feed you. You can have anything. You can have any food in my house. But that doesn't mean I'm going to put you in my house. Right? Come on. We do what's necessary for physical inspiration. Some people get into all using and abusing. They're like, see, see, see? Put me up. I'm saying it's your place. You get all entitled. See, the church wasn't the benevolent organization in the first century. The people they were reaching out to were the benevolent organization. Really reaching. He sent them out. No money, no tunic. He said, you go stay with who you're reaching out to. Eat whatever they give you. Don't complain about it. Eat whatever they give you. And stay at their house until you leave that city. It was, it was reversed, actually. It was reversed. Yet far be it from us if somebody's really hungry to not feed our brothers and sisters. Right, bro. Right? If, if their house is burned down and all their, they ain't got no clothes, then, then we don't help them. I'm bringing two drastic things. There's a lot in the middle that we do. Right? There's a lot in between that that we do. But we identify the sin. We don't let taking become sin. Yeah. Right. Amen. He says, if you do nothing about the physical needs, what good is it? In the same way. Faith by itself, if it is not accompanied with what? Is what? Yeah. Can death say sin? Oh. Wow. We better keep our faith alive. Come on. Faith is something that you are fully accountable before God. You're fully accountable for it. If your face hurt, there's nobody you can point to, there's no situation you can point to to say, that's why my face gone. Now, having little faith means we take our faith, right, and we throw it back to God. Take it back. I don't want it. I like my anger right now. This one just triggered me. I got triggered, and that was it. So take my faith back. I don't want it. I'm good. Right? I feel I'm going to protect myself. I feel safe right back here. Come on. Right? God says, no, you contend for your faith. Right. You fight for you get out this word and you read it and you do it. Yeah. Yeah. He says, someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. He says, show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by what I do. He says, you believe there's, there's one God? Good. Even the demons believe that. He says, you foolish man, do you not do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? It says, was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? He goes, see, being a good Christian does work. Mm. Here's nothing wrong. Verse 22, you see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by one. See, Pestis, our faith. It's a strong conviction or belief that we hold. And the Bible says, faith without actions is dead. You know when God told Noah to build the ark? He gave him every measurement, every little st stitch of information he needed, step by step, on how to build the ark. <laughs> Complete instructions. And they were very specific. You think it's any different with these deeds he's talking about? Right? You think it's any different about the deeds, the way we're supposed to live every day? Waking up in the morning, getting right into your Bible, having a great quiet time? That's one of your deeds. Yep. Right? Well. So faith without deeds is what? Yeah. Dead. 
Come on. Life without quiet times is what? Mm. Mm. And, and yet he says that we're entrusted with this salvation to share it with others. Now, we have an incredible church. I look around, there's, there's some new people around. That's a really awesome to have you all. And yet, I put before you that it is totally possible that we fill this whole room one day. Yeah. Right? I think next month at our Harvest Sunday, this room can be full. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, what do you think? Yeah. I think it's work. Are you too busy? Is that the problem? No. You don't have enough time for the deeds to fill this room? See, it says they did not love their life so much as to shrink back from death. Okay. Let me tell you what, to fill this room is going to feel like death. Oh. Yeah, no, I mean, no. Out there, just boom, boom, being rejected, embarrassed, oh, rejection, that triggered me. Oh, pull back. <laughs> All right. Come on, bro. But Jesus was rejected for you. Jesus lived like death for you. Why don't we take some time this summer in our summer of love and do the same back for Him? Because salvation is so awesome. And it changed everything. See, James, James is pretty cool in this, this passage. Come on, James James is pretty cool too. <laughs> he says, You believe that there is one God. He goes, sorry, that's not enough. See, if you read it backwards, he goes, even the demons believe. You know, the demons actually believe more than you do. It's very real to them, God. So if the demons believe that God is who he says he is, if the demons believe that Jesus is his son and the Messiah is sent to save everybody, and they believe it deeper than you do, why aren't they saved? Come on. Why aren't they saved? The Bible says they shudder. Do you know what, what a demon is? A demon is an angel. That's it. It's just a fallen angel. Right? Well, what can angels do? One of them just kind of like went, wiped out 185,000 people in one night. Demons are power. Yeah. Man, if you could wipe out 185,000 people in one day, what would you be afraid of? Right? And yet you're going to judge angels, the Bible says. The Bible says that, 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 that those who are saved will judge angels. Oh. You're going to judge a being that can wipe out a big city in one, one, one swoosh. That's what God's trusting. I think we're not doing very much with what God is trusting us with. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. This room should be full of people who are hearing our testimony, who know what God did for you before they walk through this door. Come on, bro. What do you think? Yeah. Are, you, are your kids so important to you that you can't do that? Is your job that important to you that you don't have time for that? See, what does the Bible really teach? It means to follow Jesus. John 14. If you love me, you'll do what I have been doing. In fact, he's trusted you so much, he said you'll do greater things. Than you. You'll do greater things. Let me ask you something. Are you treated just like Jesus was treated? Nope. Let me think. How was Jesus treated? He was betrayed. When he needed his friends most, they were not there for him. They abandoned him. He was accused. In John 6, see, people said his teachings were too tough. That's what they said about him. You expect too much. Who in the world can do that? Who can be saved? In John 6, most of the people following you left. You have people walking out on you because your teaching's too tough? Come on, bro. Right? Come on, bro. That's right. Are you teaching? Oh. Come on. Come on, bro. Who are you teaching? That part. Come on, bro. If you value what God did for you so much, who are you, who are you offering it to? 
bar. You show what it really means to you in that moment. But here's the awesome thing. One decision changes all that. One decision right now changes all that. It doesn't matter what you did until you walked through this door. What matters is what you're going to do when you walk out because the past is in the past. Are we going to give this salvation that we have? Are we going to offer it to this world who so desperately needs it? You know, having a saving faith is a real struggle. That's why you've got to contend for it. If it wasn't a struggle, everybody would do it. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it wasn't a struggle, everybody would do it. And yet, uh, I love our leader, Tim Kernan. It's great to have people who are very different than you. <laughs> Tim is this, like, six foot two, big Irish Canadian, like, really white, with bright red hair, big old Viking. <laughs> He walks around, he's got a knife inside his shirt. We're going to pull out. He's a military guy. Loves to fish, hunt. And yet he speaks about his life in relating to all of us. I'm so grateful for him. He says, What we do as disciples is the scariest thing on the planet. I was like, Get out of here, it's not scary. He's like, this is the scariest thing we do. I didn't get it. I've been here with him for two years, and I didn't get it until about a month ago. He goes, it's the scariest thing on the planet because God commands us to trust everyone and to forgive anyone who does anything to us. It's the scariest thing on the planet. Here's what's scary about it. Because we don't just do it, we do it with a smile. We happily do it. We happily offer forgiveness. Oh. <laughs> Does that know what the Bible says? Right? Turn the other cheek. You think he's joking when he says that? Oh, no. Come on, Jimmy. He doesn't say return the favor. He says turn the other cheek. So if somebody hits you, you don't hit them back. I just want to make sure we're clear on that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We don't hit them back with a smile. <laughs> See, real Christians contend for the faith. Right? They fight to not throw their faith away. Hebrews, it says, your, your helmet of salvation, right? You take that off, it means you forgot you're saved. So you don't act like that. The belt of truth it means you forget. You're not memorizing God's word, so you forget the scriptures that will save you. You end up with your pants down. Right. <laughs> Embarrassing. <laughs> your breastplate. The example of your life that you live. Your righteousness. Yeah. Everybody likes shoes. Yeah. You know what the shoes are in the kingdom? Mm -hmm. Your readiness to do whatever it is God asks you. Yeah. Then you got your sword. Right? Here's your sword. Oh. It's crazy. I come into counseling sessions with people and they, you know, they don't bring their sword. They're not ready to fight for their faith. They go, oh, you have a Bible I can borrow? I don't have a problem. Right there. Oh, you can keep it, please. Yeah. You have a phone? Yeah, is it a smartphone? Yeah. You have a Bible? What are you doing? Oh. Real Christians fight for their faith. Come on, bro. That makes them what? Trustworthy. Worthy to be entrusted with something precious. Real Christians struggle and fight through whatever it is. Fake Christians, however, pull their heart back from each other. We first pull our heart back away from the scriptures and we yeah. stop reading and we stop praying yeah. and then we pull our heart back from God's people because they're just like God. Wow. So if I don't want to be, if I don't want to spend time with God, I, of course I don't want to spend time with these people because they're just like Him. So they run from their Bible. They run from praying. They run from all the difficult people. And they run from commitment. 
and they run from giving their heart. Any situation, I gotta give my heart, I'm out of here. And they refuse, refuse to forgive the way God tells them to forgive. Right? Oh, everybody says, oh, I forgive you. Will you hug me? Will you hang out with me? Will you draw closer to me? Because if not, you haven't forgiven. It's one thing to say I forgive. It's another thing to do it the way the Bible says to do it. See, we want to not do it the way the Bible says to do it, and then leave me alone. I don't want to be told about it. And we just don't do that. See, the look on your face when you say I forgive tells you the whole story. Right? Because disciples forgive with a smile. Yeah. Why? Because they're remembering their salvation. They're remembering the mercy God gave them and they're so fired up to give it to somebody. Right. It's, like, it's like a thing to participate in giving this mercy and grace. It feels awesome to give grace. Because you know what you're doing? You're taking that sin that didn't forgive, the weight of the world, and you're getting it off your shoulders. And you're letting God deal with it. And you're showing you trust God. Now many of you have had a rough past. Many of you have had a very rough past. And yet, heroes are born in the face of adversity. Come on. In the heat of battle, in the worst of it, aren't the greatest heroes in the worst of it? Yeah. What do you think God's been doing with you? All right. What do you think God's been doing with you in your so, your so tough situation? I don't make light of it. I know it's tough. I know it's bad. Just the problem is you think nobody else went through it. You go, well, you're like kind of a right. proper talking right. Hispanic looking guy. Right. <laughs> what do you know about my life? What do you know? Well, if I could take my shirt off, you'd understand. Right. If you could see the scars on me, you'd understand. Come on. Right? Come on. I mean, do you, do you think your weak, cowardly parent who beat you, anything compared to a big old truck driver beating me? Think I don't know about it? I know all about it. You think I don't know about somebody going off, getting drunk, and coming back and beating the trash out of my mom, and then beating, then beating me for protecting her? You think just because it wasn't in the hood that it didn't happen? Just like it happens in you? It happens everywhere. It happens in the worst neighborhoods. It happens in the best neighborhoods. It happens everywhere because everybody's got sin in them. Stop restricting your thinking to the hood. Come on, Come on, bro. I've been in some really big homes that are really nasty. Right? There's some really big places that are really not taken care of well. It can be the same no matter where you're at. But remember, heroes are born in the worst of tragedies. That's what God's planning for you. That's what He was doing with you all. The worst you had it, the bigger of a hero He's making you. Come on, bro. So you better share that testimony. Never stop contending for your faith. But our last point. And it ain't about you. <laughs> My last point is it ain't about you. Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Going a little long, but I think we need it. Matthew 25, verse 14. Again, it'll be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. You know, Rico read that scripture that Jesus bought you. Mm. You're his property. You're his slave. You're here to do his bidding. To one, he gave five talents of money. That was the fired up dude right there. To another, two talents. They all kind of fired up. There's another one talent. That's the guy with the attitude sitting in the back row, right? AJ's not that guy. He's back there, but he's working. <laughs> this says, then he went on his journey. See, God has done some things in your life. He's entrusted your experiences to you so that you would do with those experiences what he has intended for you. 
Mm. It says the man who received five talents went at once and he put his money to work and gained five more. So let's get let's get really practical. What does five more mean? It means that man went and found five more men just like him and brought them to church and baptized them. That's what that means. It says, so also the one with two talents gave two more. Nobody cares how many people you baptize. You baptize as many people as you choose to. According to your talent and your faith. It says, the man who had received one talent, right? That's the one who feels like they had it harder than everybody else. Okay. He went off, dug a hole, and put his salvation in it. Let's just read it like what it really is conveying, right? Come on. He put it in a hole. It says here, after a long time. So you can live a long time like that. Yeah. It's miserable, but you can live like that. After a long time, the master of those servants returned to settle accounts with them. This is called when you die, right? right. It says... The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. The master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I've gained five more. That's probably Aaron the Crick. Yep. <laughs> yeah. right. The master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. The man of two talents came. Also again. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Then the man who received the one talent, master, he said, I knew you were a hard man, man. You gave me a rough life. I just couldn't muster up any strength. He said, oh, you're a hard man. You're hard. See where you're not sown and gathering where you're not scattered. See, you put all this work on me of sharing my faith and doing this for this person, doing that. You didn't do anything for me. He said, so I was afraid. I couldn't forgive the way you told me to. I was too afraid to. I couldn't talk to these people that are hurting in this city. I was too afraid to tell them about you. Because you haven't done enough for me. Here, here's what belongs to you. That's really what it's going to be like on the day of judgment. You talk about eternal, eternity, and hell. Actually, they're going to be mad at God. People are going to feel entitled. Like, just let me in. No fun. Whatever. And they'll be in that perpetual state of whatever. Forever. Confused. Oh, I went to church all the time. What? What, what in the world? You're not going to let me in? No, fine. Whatever. I'll go be with Satan. And angry for all eternity. Talk about it. Think about your worst day here. You'll be like that forever. If you throw your faith. Master replied, you wicked and lazy servants. You knew I harvested where I'm not sown and gathered where I'm not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money in deposit. You could have at least put it in the bank and there would be a little something and I would have let you in. I wanted to let you in. You chose to not come here. At the end of Judgment Day, all those that go to hell, they chose it. They're, people are choosing it right now. Some of us have contemplated choosing it again. Come on. You've got to remember what God did for you. The legs he went to get you. How many years of preparation did he put to setting up that person to talk to you? How many days and hours and nights, night after night was he thinking about you? You were crying and he was crying. And he was putting everybody in your life to change it for you. And he was trusting that person to actually be there. Kids. Raise your hand if you have kids. Look around the room. Okay, I got a good question for you. Who do you trust with your kids? <laughs> Who do you trust with your kids? I feel sad for you if you only have one or two people. I feel very sad for you because you don't understand God. Come on. 
You don't understand God. See, if you're a parent, right? I have two boys, right? Devin and Bill. Well, my older son, Devin, got sexually abused by his high school teacher. I should just not trust people anymore, right? Mm. That's what the world says. I should have her hunted down in China where she fled to and have her murdered, right? I should condemn her to hell, right? She's God's child. Come on. You think God doesn't want to save her? Yeah. Should not that be my mission for her to be saved one day no. because I forgave her? I think I'm not going to trust people with my kids anymore. I trust my kids with any of you. All of you. Some of you come in here drug using, sleeping with people, doing all kinds of crazy stuff, and I trust my kids with you. Come on, bro. Come on. Come on, bro. Why? Because you committed that you would be a disciple of Jesus for the, the rest of your days. So I take you at your word and I trust you. Come on, bro. And I trust you with my kids. God has put it on my heart how terrorized they are by letting my own son be terrorized. Every night he lays in bed, unable to get up. Terrorized, nightmares, seizures, you name it, he's going through it. I would trust him with anyone. Anyone. At any time. To be his friend. To show him the Bible. To show him it's not all hate. In Genesis 1, 28, God blessed them. That's his response to us and all of our sin. Right? I watched the movie The Shack. I was weeping about what a lack of compassion I have for this lost world. Come on. The terrible things that people are going through. The terrible things that make people terrible. And God blessed 
will bless that terrible person just like he blessed you. He says, be fruitful. Increase in number. Fill the earth. They're my kids. Save them. Fill the earth and subdue it. Lastly, you've got to contend for everyone's faith. Everyone's faith. Now, do you notice he doesn't say try to be fruitful? He doesn't say that. Why? Because he tells you how to do it in John 15. Just remain in me and you're going to bear all kinds of fruit. The problem is we keep pushing God away and pushing our faith away and giving it back to him in the moments when he's trying to make it strongest. He says one very simple thing. You live a life of bearing fruit or you'll spend eternity with the fruit. That's what he says. Today, we've got to get it on straight, church. We've got to give it, we've got to grab our faith back. Salvation is awesome. Mm. And I don't want you walking out of here sad. I want you walking out of here understanding what you have. Come on. You have salvation. You are going to be with God for all eternity. Whatever terrorizing thing he puts you through for the rest of your life, he will get you through it. And you'll be stronger when you get to the end. It's a promise that he makes. Because salvation is awesome and it changes everything, especially the tough things. He says, contend for your faith. Because I have plans for you. My plan is I trust you. I trust you'll take this precious gift I gave you, this Holy Spirit that's living in you. And no matter what's happening, you'll see the others that don't have it and have compassion on their soul. And you'll share with everything that moves in this city. When you get that part, like I'm committing, I'm having with you, we're going to fill this room up this summer and we're going to save more people.